So these were the citizen soldiers, the people who lived within the home county uh, of Upper Canada, what's now Ontario, and fought in the defense of their community during the War of 1812. Oh. We're very fortunate to have these fellows here today. They're volunteering their time this weekend to come out and help with uh, animating the site. So instead of going up to the cottage or uh, enjoying a nice day on the beach, they get to wear wool uniforms in a beautiful May Day like this one. Now the uniforms they're wearing would be appropriate for embarking militiamen during the uh, middle months of the War of 1812. So they're in the uniforms that you would have seen in about 1813, the summer of 1813. Uh, the green uniform being worn by most of the militiamen was a, a bit of a stopgap. Uh, ideally, they wanted the militiamen to be in red, but there was not enough red coats available, and so. Many militia units had to make do with uh, these green uniforms. Now you notice though that the person giving commands, the officer, is in a red coat. And that's because the officers were expected to procure their own uniform and equipment themselves. So they paid a, a uniform tailor made for them and they would be able to uh, afford the more expensive scarlet cloth to get the uniform made. Now what we're going to see is a demonstration of the muskets that these guys are armed with. These are, of course, today replica uh, firearms, but they are made in the same manner that they would have been made at the time of the War of 1812. Now the musket is a smoothbore firing, a firearm, should I say, there's no rifling in the musket. And so the musket had very limited accuracy at extended ranges. So in order to make up for the accuracy of the musket, uh, they trained soldiers to work in groupings known as platoons. So these platoons were trained to load and fire the muskets together in unison. Now in order to be effective in this uh, style of fighting, uh, you had to instill a lot of discipline, you had to instill a lot of training. So even though these guys, you know, a few months before the War of 1812, they would have been farmers, they would have been townspersons, uh, they would, many of them would have not had any military background whatsoever, uh, they would have to uh, receive the same type of training that professional regular soldiers would have received in order to be effective on the battlefield. So these farmers, these uh, townsmen, they would have had to uh, go through rigorous training uh, to not only learn how to use the musket effectively, but also how to uh, cooperate effectively, march together in unison, standing shoulder to shoulder. Right now, they're just doing a quick inspection of the muskets, making sure that everything is clean and is in working order. Now you notice that they've withdrawn these long steel ramrods, as they're called, from underneath the musket barrels. These ramrods are incredibly important in loading the muskets. You see, muskets were yeah. muzzle-loading firearms, meaning that you had to put the gunpowder and bullet down the mouth or muzzle of the barrel. And then you had to seat that charge at the breech, the bottom of the barrel. So this ramrod was important to push the charge all the way down the barrel. Uh, the soldier back then wouldn't want to lose his ramrod or accidentally fire it out of his pocket. Because then he was left essentially with a very ineffective club. Now, the soldier would have to go through a series of steps, and what we're going to see first is the, uh, the various steps involved in loading the musket, so it's all going to be broken down. So pay attention to what they're doing, and I'll describe what you're seeing. So they get into position, again, locked up nice and tight, standing shoulder to shoulder. The first thing they need to do is to prime the lock, or the firing mechanism, of the musket. So they bring the musket down to their side, and then you'll notice that they'll reach around to their back and open up a black level pouch, known as a cartridge pouch. Inside that pouch would be the round paper cartridges that they would store the gunpowder and the bullet in. They tear open the 
cartridge with the teeth, and then pour a little bit of gun powder as primer into the pan, just enough to fill it. Right, so we'll they then the pass the musket up. down to the side, and pour the rest of the gun powder, paper, bullet down the muzzle of the gun. So this is that muzzle loading part I was talking about earlier. Withdraw ramrods! Then they withdraw the ramrods and use that to push the charge all the way down to the breach to the and of course, return the ramrods. So with the weapon now primed and the main charge rammed to the breach of the barrel, they're ready to fire. Now this is going to be a little loud, so if you want to plug your ears, this is the time to do it. <laughs> to fire the musket, they bring it up to the make ready. Make ready! Make ready. They present. And... Ah! Now you notice, even with just a small <laughs> amount of guys in the field, how much smoke is produced by these muskets. Yeah. This smoke explains in part why soldiers and militiamen at this time wore such colorful and decorative uniforms. You can imagine on a battlefield where if you, you might have had hundreds if not thousands of men firing muskets, cannon going off, You'd have these billowing clouds of grey smoke starting to cover the blanket, uh, blanket of the battlefield. And so these uniforms, quite frankly, were the best way to tell who is on your side, who is on your side. Yeah, you can Now I mentioned before that the musket was not a very accurate weapon because it didn't have the rifling in the barrel. And so by having the soldiers file in unison, you're essentially sending a wall of lead down towards the enemy. So again, these fellas here before you represent the second regiment of York militia. These would have been uh, men who uh, lived within what's now Peel and Horton region and volunteered to serve in the defense of their community during the War of 1812. Today, these fellas are volunteer reenactors. They've come down here to help animate the site. And this is their way of saying thank you. They're giving you a salute. Now they're going to stick around to uh, take any questions. So if you have any, fo uh, uh, you, know, you want to take a photograph of any of these fine fellows, they're going to come forward, oh, and uh, and you can hang out and talk to them and uh, ask them any question you want. You can ask them if they're hot in their uniform, for example. Now, uh, for those who are interested, the site is open today for doors open. All of our buildings are open except for the ones indicated the staff only. So check them out. Check out the exhibits, displays. Please feel free to interact with the cartridges, paper cartridges he would need to load yeah. fire his musket. And then off his left hip, he has his bayonet, 17 inches of solid steel designed to fit over the end of the musket barrel. So uh, basically you have a, a combination of a firearm and steel. Now, because he's just wearing civilian attire, you can imagine on uh, some battlefields early in the War of 1812, uh, determining who was who could be a little difficult. If, say, the upper Canadian militia were wearing their regular civilian clothes and the New York militia were wearing their regular civilian clothes, how can we tell who's who? Well, you notice he has a, a white uh, cloth tied around his right body. Obviously, that's a little harder because people might drop the hat during the course of the battle. <laughs> but obviously, this wasn't a really good solution. In the end, when you're asking these men to uh, defend their communities, uh, sometimes uh, they would be called up for extended periods of time. Uh, you would want to uh, issue them proper uniforms. So by the middle of the war, the militia began to be issued with green uniforms. And gentlemen in the middle represents the militiamen from, from the middle of the war, so about 1813. Now, ideally, they wanted to have all the Canadian militiamen in red, just like the regular soldiers back then, but uh, there wasn't enough uh, red coats being delivered here from the United Kingdom, so they had to make do with these green jackets oh. instead. 
They also uh, began to issue militiamen as standard trousers and shoes and caps. By the end of the war, more and more with the traditional red coat of the British infantry. So the last gentleman you see on the field, Dale, is in the red coat that they would have been given by the end of the war. And there's actually not too much to differentiate. So those free men kind of show you the evolution of the uniforms and clothing that would have been worn by the militia. Would be able to load and fire the musket anywhere from, uh, say, about 15 to 20 seconds, resulting in a theoretical rate of fire of three, even four shots a minute. But that uh, rate of fire was not sustainable. You wouldn't be able to keep it up indefinitely. And it was the officer's job, the gentleman in the red coat you see there, to control the rate of file. Uh, it wasn't the speed at which you could load and file, but how deliberate that file was that was going to determine who would win or lose.